Doug Temkin from the English department. I'd like to welcome you to this, the uh, first in the WOW series, Writers on Writing. Uh, you can look for a couple more talks next semester uh, from the series, and all the talks will be on the theme of research and research writing this year. Uh, Audrey Lynch is going to be talking about, as you probably know, about interviewing, using interviews in, as, re as research, uh, corporate and managing research papers and research writing. Uh, she's the ideal person for this because she has two books, one of which is available here after uh, the talk if you want, uh, and they'll be at the library too. Both the books are interviews that she did. This one with 20 people who knew the author John Steinbeck, person uh, who was on a ship with him when he sailed in the uh, Sea of Cortez. So you can ask her about those as well. Uh, I do, before we start, want to thank the uh, Student Senate for funding this program, and uh, also the English Department and Library for its uh, sponsorship. So with that, I think I'll introduce Audrey Lynch, if you'd welcome her, and uh, she can take it from there. Thank you. Well, it's great to be here at, wow, I love the name. Uh, how many folks are going to be writers in the future? Okay, I see a few hands out there. What kind? Novelists, playwrights, poets. Ah, beautiful. Well, that makes my point. Everybody has a story to tell. And even if your story is only precious to your family and Any other writers? I saw a few hands back there. Congratulations because breaking in I found to children's literature So congratulations, you've really leaped the hurdle. Anybody else out there? Yes? Uh, creative writer. A creative writer, of course. Wonderful, congratulations. Oh. <laughs> you got that book inside of you and you know that someday it's gonna come out, right? Okay, well, whether you're going to be a children's writer, creative writer, memoirist, you're going to have to probably start by being an interviewer. Because the interview is what gives you your material. And you may start your career, as I did and many people did, by interviewing for high school newspaper. How many people worked in their high school newspaper? Okay. College paper. I understand you have a college paper here. Anybody working on it? Okay. What do you do for it? Uh, I'm just a writer and a copy editor. Don't say just a writer. Say I'm a writer and a copy editor. And of course you're covering. Okay. So you're probably going to use your interview. And for the rest of you, how many people are working on a research paper this semester? Oh, look at those timid little hands. Okay, so I've got some hints for you. Start getting your interview. Personally, I suggest calling the person. You might know somebody who knows them, and that could be an introduction. I think um, phoning is better probably than emails. At least get a definite answer. You have to be the golden rule of interviewing, and the rest of your human relations, of course, is the golden rule. Be polite. When you call up the person you want to interview, say, is this a good time for you? Okay? And if they say, So I would call up, and when you got them on the phone, that's the time to pin them down. Okay, what time? What place? Where are we going to meet, okay? Now, you may be saying, wait a minute. 
I've never done this. I'm only a college student. Uh, well, who's going to listen to me? Am I going to call up some CEO, some famous person, some learned professor and have them listen to me? Well, I'll let you in on a little secret. Everybody's going through life. They are going to be flattered to death. You will find that most people will absolutely love being interviewed. So don't be afraid. When I was an undergraduate, I was at Radcliffe College, which was the girl at that time, and I became college correspondent to the Boston Globe. Here I was in a field of clover, Harvard University, all the famous minds of the world coming and going. And guess who was interviewing them? A little undergraduate. And did they get published? Yes, not because of me, but because these people were famous and no one ever turned me down. And they appeared in the Globe and everybody was happy. I was thrilled to see my byline. I love getting my check. And the professors got extra publicity. Everybody was happy. Um, you have to be bold about the whole thing. You have to be courageous. How many people read Writer's Digest or The Writer? Okay, any of you aspiring writers, it's a good idea. You may find it in your college library. You know, you can hang out in a soft chair and look through one. They're very good. Now, for our future novelist, this is a, a little story about a gal who lives in Seattle, and she was going to write about an actress who... but she had forgotten some stuff. Like all writers, she didn't have much money, didn't have much time, hopped in her car, crashed at a friend's house in LA, determined to spend two weeks and just go around and get to waste. And this is what she advises new writers. I've noticed that many authors suffer from the twin maladies of call reluctance and crippling tact. Long ago, I learned that the key call, punch that number now. Want to ask a sensitive question? Plunge in and ask it. So she was a very gutsy girl. She spent her two weeks, and she got all her novel together. She said new plot twists had come to me, and I'd realized I'd never even knew I had. That's the way to do it, with confidence. Uh, and you'll be surprised at how easy it really is. Well, would it be possible for you to even interview somebody rich and famous? I have to tell you a little story. I was a housewife with three little kids, and I loved to write, so I got a job as a columnist for a local daily newspaper. That's when I found out everybody wants to tell you their story. I mean, this was a little suburban community in Massachusetts, Burlington, not the hub of the world. And I soon learned that I had to have this mental frame that everybody has a story to tell. So I would go in the supermarket, I would listen to church, whatever, and I found out there's usually something interesting about everybody. Well, one weekend, my husband was in the National Guard, and so he said, we have to go to this resort. I'm in training this. Um, I'm in training. And so we went, and when we got to the hotel, I saw this fighter marching up and down. And he had, like most professional fighters, an entourage. And I thought, who the heck is that? And somebody said, that's Cassius Clay. Well, maybe you haven't lived long enough to know that Cassius Clay was the original name of Muhammad Ali. So here's this guy strutting around with his entourage. He's practicing for the Sonny Liston fight. Well, as I said, by this time, I'm always looking for a story. So what did I do? Did I go up to one of the entourage? They would have blown me away like a fly. I went up to Mr. Clay and I said, you know, I'm a local correspondent. Could I interview you? 
He said, sure. Let's go into the hotel coffee shop and you can interview me. Ha! Huh. Well, I found out an important lesson that day. At that time, he was a young fighter and he was known as a real braggart. His big thing was, you know, I'm gonna fly like a butterfly and sting like a bee. It was all intimidation, right? And what was he like in person? Quiet, soft-spoken, extremely gentlemanly. So that's an important lesson. Sometimes the public persona of famous people is different from the private one. What you have to do is just accept people as they are. So guess who got an interview with Muhammad Ali? And of course, I've watched his career with interest. Interview, what a perfect time to network. Um, hey, you've got this person in obviously some field you're going to write about. And you may say, you know, I really love talking to you. Do you have any friends that I could call? What a nice introduction to your next interview, right? They'll say, maybe. And the other big part of the golden rule is at the end, you want to send a nice thank you. Kills two birds with one stone. Then they have your name and address. You're sort of in their file now, and you never know when you may call on them again, and they'll remember you as a nice person. What about tape recording? Okay, great idea. Great idea, because in the flurry of the moment, you're busily jotting things down, and um, you know, you get home and you think, oh gosh, did they say 200 or 300? And then you play your tape and you've got it. Big warning. You can't tape record anybody without their permission. Cursor in your lap. Don't pull any of that. Just ask the person. And probably 99% of the time they'll say, sure, okay. And then you have, if there's any discrepancy later, you have proof. Even the tabloids, like the national uh, reputation for you know lawsuits etc etc they are meticulous about their reporters recording everything and having everything on tape and you know they don't lose many suits it's a wonderful thing to do um, <clears throat> now the other thing that people are going to say to you is oh could I look at your story before you send it in to be totally professional, you probably should say no. Because being a writer is like being a professional photographer. Does and sometimes things that people say uh, to you in an offhand manner, when they see it in print, they go, oh no, did I say that? And they want all these changes. So really, I would say, gee, actually, don't do that. And I've never had a problem with that. Of course, if it's some special friend, you don't want to lose that friendship, you want to be totally sure you can. It's up to your own discretion. But I would probably encourage you not to do that. Okay, where are you going to find to interview for your paper? All right. Huh. One of the number one sources is probably right here on the campus. Uh, do you have a media relations office? I'm sure you do. They wrote me up. So you go to the media relations office at your local. Think of how many colleges there are here. The community colleges, San Jose State University, Stanford. And you say, hey, I'm writing a paper on medical ethics. Who would you suggest? Well, they know right off the top who their special person is. at your library or your home library is the reference librarian. Those people are terrific. They love being asked questions. They will love putting you in touch with people. Um, that's definitely who I would check with. Uh, there are all kinds of organizations, but I think your best bet is to, to do that. What about authors? Authors are a great source. You know why? 
authors love to be interviewed because is terrific. Another great, great source. Um, reading. Read your daily newspaper. I mean, it is an absolute fund of information about local people, local, local happenings. Here we are in the middle of Silicon Valley. If you choose something in um, science or industry or math, you know you're going to find somebody here. Okay, now where do I send my students? Well, as you can tell, I'm a Steinbeck aficionado. I usually assign a Steinbeck novel, and so when it comes time for them to write their paper, I say I like something on the life or the works of John Steinbeck, and where do I send them? Okay, the fifth floor of San Jose State University Library, the Martin Luther King, has a Martha Heasley Cox Steinbeck Center. They have about five people there, all of whom I know, and I say to them, you know, the troops are coming, and they make appointments, and they go Now, I tell my students, don't call up with something vague like, I'm going to be writing a paper about John Steinbeck. Well, so isn't the rest of the world, you know? Uh, Decide what aspect of his life or work you're going to do. Do your homework. Have your outline ready. And then call them. They call them. And guess what they have when they arrive? They usually have a printout of resources for the students to research. Is that a sweet deal? Absolutely. I tell them there's also the Steinbeck Museum in Salinas. And you say, well, that's kind of far. Hey, it's only an hour. Stanford University. Stanford has probably the best collection of Steinbeckianer in the whole country. You have to put your little plastic gloves on. They bring you out trays of primary source material, his letters. Your paper is going to have tremendous punch if you use a primary resource. In other words, a person or something um, really that's uh, very direct. Now, how did my students, um, do you want me to tell you about some of the papers that got an A? Of course you do. All right. I had two students who said, okay, we've lived here all our lives, but we don't know that much. We've never been to Cannery Row. So I said, well, now's a good time. They took down a list of all of Steinbeck's books that were connected to his California novels. They went to Cannery Row, and in all their innocence and arrogance, they stopped wherever they saw somebody, and they said, hey, you know, like Khaleesi's, they They wrote a fabulous paper of all the people who are now in the buildings made famous by Steinbeck. Then I had a gal who said, none of this can't stuff for me. I'm going to meet somebody who knew John Steinbeck. John Steinbeck died in 1968. Did this stop this gal? She called the Steinbeck Museum and Selena said, I want to meet somebody who knew Steinbeck. Well, sure enough, she turned up the Bragdons, who are people I interviewed in my book. They're in their 80s. He used to work as a young man on Cannery Row right next door to Doc's lab. She had aunts that were milliners who sold their hats to the Steinbeck women. So very sweet people. They entertained her. They invited her to their house. They spent the whole day with her telling everything they knew about John Steinbeck. Do you think that was a good paper? Sure was. But my all-time favorite was a guy. I mentioned that there was a librarian in Weed Patch which is the site of the Arvin camp made famous in the Grapes of Wrath. And they have a, a Dust Bowl festival every October. He had the chutzpah to call this librarian up. 
wrote an absolutely fabulous paper. So um, I think most teachers are very happy if you go to primary sources and get your material. Is that right, Professor Temkin? Yeah, it adds great weight and validity to your paper. Well, where do you find subjects? Well, interestingly enough, on Saturday I was at a writer's meeting talking to a technical writer who works here for Google. And I said, well, what are you doing creatively these days? And she said, well, you know what? I'm kind of researching things like ghost stories that might have some validity. And in fact, I've got so many, I started my own blog. And guess what? I'm going over to West Valley College. I'm going to, in I'm going to interview a drama professor over there who swears he has seen a ghost in the West Valley Theater. Do you know who I'm talking about? He's just about to be famous on somebody's blog. OK. All right. Now, it's not always going to be quite as easy as I have painted it. Because every person who is of note has probably what? Have you ever heard the term gatekeeper? Yes. Okay, these are PR secretaries, who knows what, that want to protect the person. Assistants, agents, and PR reps are the gatekeepers who keep their clients and bosses from going nuts trying to talk to every Yahoo with a phone and an index finger. But what if that Yahoo is you? And what if your livelihood depends on getting through to ever busy execs, doctors, government officials, and celebrities? What do you do then if you run into the inevitable no? Well, he has some very creative ideas. For example, if you go and you're really a total unknown, you might mention that you're doing the interview every two time or something like that. Well, that's impressive. They'll want their, their person in something like that. This is a really interesting one. Instead of playing phone tag, he advises that leave a message directly on your source's voicemail after hours. You won't have to deal with the secretary, the clerks, the gatekeepers. The person picks up their voicemail and there you are. It's not a bad idea. But this person does warn that it probably goes without saying that being courteous and professional and doing your homework will take you a long way toward landing that coveted interview. And I couldn't agree more. OK, some professional writers have run, though, totally into no. And one of the most famous ones who started a whole new genre of writing was Gay Talese. And he uh, was kind of famous for writing books about the Mafia, and he got a very plum assignment from with Frank Sinatra, and he was delighted. Well, every time he called Frank Sinatra up, his gatekeepers said, oh, Mr. Sinatra can't do it. He's got a cold. He's got to save his voice. ambitious writer. So what did Gay Talese do? He talked to Frank Sinatra's mother, father, two ex-wives, girlfriends, children's, friends, hang without ever getting one word from Frank Sinatra. It was an overview of his life. It's a very, very famous um, article, and guess what it's called? <laughs> the guy was ruthless. And that sort of continues till today. In one of my alumni magazines, I picked up this, and two Washington reporters decided that this was the year, not surprisingly, to write a book about Hillary Clinton. And the name of the book is, it's just been released, Her Way, 
The Hopes and Ambitions of Hillary Rodman Clinton, put out by none other than a top publisher, Little Brown. had written uh, her up about the Whitewater scandal. So naturally she was feeling a little hostile and didn't want to give them a story. And she even told the people around her, nada, nada on these guys. Following her that, didn't, that don't listen and think for themselves. And this is what these two guys came up with. We ended up talking to hundreds of people. We had documents that hadn't been released before that were given to us by people who had worked on the 1992 campaign in particular. They got a ton of stuff. They never talked to Hillary. They came out with her biography anyhow. For Little Brown. Pretty fabulous. Okay. Um, how do you prepare for your interview? Uh, it would be nice to just sit there like a little sponge with your interview person and just absorb all their knowledge. But it'll be a much more profitable interview if you do your homework first. Go to your computer. Do your reading. So that when you get there, wouldn't it be great to tell your person, oh, I read that article, or I know that you were the, for this or that. They will be dazzled. Do your homework. Make a little outline. Have your questions ready. Notes. Um, don't forget to get the basics about some of these people. Um, be sure and get their name and spell it correctly. Please. Academic degrees if they have them, um, their contact information, names of their books, where they work, uh, contact information, this is if they're going to let you uh, talk to them. Okay? I think um, get as much as you can. Now, the other trick is, and it's not really a trick, it's really good interviewing strategy is ask open-ended questions. Don't give them an easy way out by giving them an answer that they can say an, a, a very easy yes or no. Uh, do you like President Bush? Yes or no? No. What do you think? Leave it open and flowing so they have to say something. You don't want to wind up with a yes and no interview, right? You're laughing. You already do that, huh? <laughs> okay. When you're ending your interview, you turn to them. You've had a pleasant interview, hopefully. And you turn to them and you say, is there anything about this subject you'd like to add? Or you think something the readers should know? I guarantee that you are probably going to get your best comment of the day. And the joke among interviewers and reporters is you usually get your best quote after you turn off your recorder and someone hits you with a blockbuster. But that ending kind of puts the ball in their court. And there usually is something they want to say to people, their own little message. And then, of course, you either have your opener or your, your ender. It's a very The number one thing, in addition to being courteous and doing your homework, is probably when you interview people, and this may be funny sounding to you, is you have to be flexible. You are on the turf of the person you are interviewing, and they are, they run the whole gamut of, of, of human nature. So you're going to, you're going to 
to find all kinds of things. First of all, it's highly unlikely that you are going to interview somebody with exactly your interests or your background. Doesn't matter. You're a writer. You're, you're, you're a thinker. It doesn't matter that you have nothing in the world in common with this person. You're correctly. Now, one woman who wrote in here almost didn't follow that direction. She was <coughs> researching some stuff, and she ran into this guy And he said, I really want you to write my story. And he was telling her what it was like to be a prisoner of war, the battle he was in. And she was thinking to herself, hey, I don't care. You know, I've never been in the service. I've never been a prisoner of war. I know nothing about the Korean War, and I care less. And the guy kept bugging her. And so she finally said, oh, OK. She was a professional writer. She said, mostly to shut him up, OK, I'll do, I won't write a book, but I'll write a book. He started introducing her to all his veteran friends. And do you know where that led to? Three books. She has written three books, including one that tells the story. of things like post-traumatic stress uh, disorder. She went to all these original sources, and she's got a wealth of material. It's practically become her career. And she said, you know, if I hadn't made that decision to listen to this guy, look at all I would have missed, all these people, all these books, all these writing things. And then she makes a very, very good point. I learned that in times of stress, people forget or misinterpret some details. So the remember different things. OK, that's a good thing to remember. It's just like if you've ever been in an accident, you know, the police go around and they try to get everybody's story. I No. It's just that you see things from different points of view. So she got practically a career out of it. Well, <laughs> there are some, some hazards to all of this. You have to be flexible. Uh, Professor Jackson Benson of San Jose State wrote probably the totally definitive biography of um, John Steinbeck. It is considered the Bible of Steinbeck studies. He was within probably one or two months of publication. And guess what? He was the authorized biographer. If you're rich and famous, you can pick out your own biographer. The whole Steinbeck family said, we're going to go with this guy. He was a Stanford grad. They respected his work, et cetera, et cetera. He found every, all the Steinbecks open and willing. And then they started reading some of the manuscript. He was also, like most interviewers, hopefully, totally honest. Well, the two Steinbeck sons looked at the manuscript and said, yikes, this is very unflattering to my mother, the second Mrs. Steinbeck. Well, I'm sure it was. And I'm sure, though, that Professor Benson was sure of his facts. But what happens then? The two sons said, if you print, we're going to sue you. So suddenly, the biographer and the two sons had to go into negotiations, right? And he had to cut out probably a couple hundred pages of his book. Not a happy feeling for a writer. And I love his comment about his, made by his wife. She said to him, Next time you do a biography, make sure it's an often. Well, he didn't. He's just completed a, uh, a biography of Wallace Stegner. But I think that issue kind of still stings with him, you know? And so um, 
that's one of the things that can happen. Well, when I decided to write my books, um, <clears throat> I'll tell you how it all came about. I was a, a Steinbeck book festival. Has anybody been to that? It's the first weekend in August every year, and it's great. Lots of lectures and movies and trips. And they used to have a little panel. Needless to say, they don't have one anymore. And it was called Friends of John Steinbeck. You know, it's kind of dominated by academics and academic papers. And here was this guy, and he had been a fisherman in Monterey. He was part of the tradition of the Sicilian fishermen down there. He came from a fishing family. And <clears throat> he was in the, the lucky position that when Steinbeck decided on going to the Sea of Cortez, uh, Steinbeck rented the boat from his brother-in-law, Captain Tom. And Sparky signed on for the trip. Well, Sparky, as I said, has a, had a great career as a fisherman. His family even owned a sardine cannery for a while, the Aeneas Cannery. Uh, and then he went on in later life to be a, um, a caddy. And then he, he was also a boxer. He was a rough and ready guy. As his nephew once said to me, you know, what you see is what you get, you know. Definitely earthy. Um, and he, people were kind of ignoring him because, you know, he was a rough, uncultured, uncultivated kind of guy. And I flashed in. I'm originally from New England, so, you know, this whole Steinbeck thing has a, a special mystique for me, I guess. And... <clears throat> I'm talking to a real Steinbeck character. So I became Sparky's ghost. I think you know what a, a ghost writer is. He had the story, and I like to write. Well, how do we put this together, though? Tooted sort of a guy. And by that time, he was probably in his late 70s or 80s. And I live in Saratoga here. And he lived down there, so I had to drive down, and I had to get on Sparky's schedule. By this time, Sparky's day consisted of a lot of drinking. So, I would meet him at Segovia's bar in the morning and Alfredo's bar in the afternoon. You should hear my tapes. And these are all Sparky's friends surrounding us, right? Hey, Sparky, did you tell her this? Did you tell her that? All these shouts, glasses clinking, and I'm trying to get a story. It was hard, and I had to go with the flow and buy Sparky drinks, but I got the story. <laughs> and then I would have to kind of transcribe it. I would take home the... Is this correct? Is that correct? And he'd say, you know, some of this is kind of repetitious. Well, if you've been at a party and somebody's been drinking... It gets repetitious. So that was kind of overwhelming odds, but I got the story. So how did my second book on Steinbeck develop? Well, I started lecturing. I'd gotten so much material, and I went around lecturing, and people would pop up at my lectures, and they would have, have something to offer me. This little lady came up, sweet little lady, said to me, I don't usually tell people this, but I was Steinbeck's next door neighbor. Boing, red flag, always be ready. <laughs> and I interviewed her. And um, she was younger than Steinbeck. She had a crush on him. She was always over their house, so she had all these great stories to tell me about the mother and father. I'll tell you about some of the others. Well, I told you about the Bragdons. I read in um, Selena's paper, as I said, you have to kind of keep reading. That gives you a lot of things. 
It was a, a woman who had gone to high school with John Steinbeck and had all these memories of him. She was in a nursing home. Well, there I was. He was a, a neighbor of Steinbeck. He told me he'd meet me in the Steinbeck house, which is a place now that's a restaurant. I, I had to meet two cops that knew Steinbeck. I went to their house, um, Jimmy and Frank Rodriguez, and their opinion was great. They didn't like him at all. They thought he was a mess, you know. Uh, Kalisa Moore, she's still down on the row. Um, the grandson of the madam. who has become a very, very successful businessman. And I go sometimes to Palm Springs. He has, he said, come over to my um, trailer park in Cathedral City. Well, the trailer park had these elaborate trailers. Probably the minimum was 100,000. So we sat in this luxurious uh, place. Uh, Louise Travis, I happen to be in Arizona. She was married to Tex Travis, and she said, well, I'm retired now down in Lake Havasu, so we were there. We went to her. Uh, sometimes you don't have to look far away. I found a neighbor a street away, Bill Thomas, in, right here in Saratoga, who had grown up in Monterey and had lots of stories for me. Jake Stock, fascinating guy. He was one of the people that uh, started. Uh, my one of my most dramatic, oh, George Beatty over in Las Gatas, a rancher. He had been their neighbor. John Baggerly, who had written, um, who was the editor of the uh, paper over in Las Gatas. One of my most dramatic was Horace Bristol. Horace Bristol was a life photographer, and I met somebody who knew him, and she said, You better hurry, you know, Horace is getting kind of old. He had gone with Steinbeck down to the Arvin camp. He had taken pictures, they've since traveled all around the country, of the Jodes, basically the people that Steinbeck used for the Jodes. It was fascinating. So this contact called me and said, you know, Horace, has, I mean, um, Horace Bristol has just been admitted to the hospital down here. So I called Mr. Bristol up, and he said, you know, I'm a little weak at night. Could you call me in the morning? Very anxious to tell me his story about his involvement in the Grapes of Wrath and how he took pictures. I called him the next morning. He gave me a wonderful, insightful interview. The next day he was dead. So that's pretty dramatic. Well, I had another little surprise waiting for me at the end of my book. I thought, this is great. It tells about Steinbeck during his California years, how people saw him, what they thought about him. I put it all into my publisher who said, that's great. Did you get a permission slip from each of these people? I said, no. Was I supposed to? Well, to tell you the truth, they had all become my friends. They were lovely people. I sent them a permission an envelope. I had done 20 interviews. 19 permission slips came back like nothing. But that was taking a chance. <laughs> so maybe you should check first about permission slips. One didn't come back. I thought, what? Down on Monterey. She was a very colorful gal. Uh, she even had a little Steinbeck museum in behind her shop. She had, she was dramatic. She had tremendous stories. I thought, Alicia, why can't we slip? And she said, quote, I've decided not to do it. You can't publish my story. She talked about having high wine at five with Doc Ricketts and all these great stories. I couldn't move her. I thought, I can't believe this. So I asked a neighbor of hers, hey, how can I get Alicia to give me her story? And do you know what that person said? Alicia makes all those stories up. 
And when she finally realized it was going to be in print, she was embarrassed because all the people down in Wanderoo would say, oh yeah, she right. So I quickly had to find another one, and I found one better, really. I found John Steinbeck's first cousin. I think he was 90 by then, Stanford Steinbeck. He lived in a beautiful home in Portola Valley. He was so gracious, so gentlemanly. Uh, I went up, he had his uh, caregiver go out and buy us a gourmet lunch. He loved to drink red wine. We had a fabulous uh, meeting. <clears throat> and, and a lot of people have said they liked that the best because here is an actual Steinbeck family member. So, you know, it all worked out, but it's a little hairy when that sort of thing happens. Okay, um, so that's the story on getting permission. So that might be something you look into before you interview someone, or if it's going to be published somewhere. If it's just your term paper, no, but if you want to get something published. Um, I'd like to close with a quote from the lady who wrote about the Korean War veterans, because she is um, the ultimate interviewer. The greatest gift people can give us as writers is their memories. The details that reveal who they are and what they've seen and heard. Our job is to listen intently, observe closely, and write honestly. And I hope you do that when you do your interviews. Thank you very much. <laughs>